All right, everybody. Okay, before you start chapter 15, section 3, okay, you need to understand it's a pretty heavy chapter and there's a lot of terminology. Um, but in, just to keep in mind a couple of things, when they talk about variation, they're just talking about differences within a population. When they say heritable traits, that means that those are traits or characteristics, physical things that we have or that other animals or living things have that can be passed on to your offspring. So, for example, eye color, that's a heritable trait. Okay, it's something that you can pass on to your children. And as we already know, the reason why we're able to pass on those things is because those traits are coded for in our DNA. So keep that in mind, okay, as you're reading this chapter. Okay, good luck. And I hope you enjoy it. Chapter 15, Section 3. Darwin Presents His Case. When Darwin returned to England in 1836, he brought back specimens from around the world. Subsequent findings about these specimens soon had the scientific com community abuzz. Darwin learned that his Galapagos mockingbirds actually belonged to three separate species found nowhere else in the world. Even more surprising, the brown birds that Darwin had thought to be wrens, wobblers, blackbirds, were all finches. They, too, were found nowhere else. The same was true of the Galapagos tortoises, the marine iguanas, and many plants that Darwin had collected on the islands. Each island species looked a great deal like a similar species on the South American mainland. Yet, the island species were clearly different from the mainland species and from one another. Publication of On the Origin of Species Darwin began filling notebooks with his ideas about species diversity and the processes that would later be called evolution. However, he did not rush out to publish his thoughts. Recall that Darwin's ideas challenged fundamental scientific beliefs of his day. Darwin was not only stunned by his discoveries, he was disturbed by them. Years later, he wrote, It was evident that such facts as these could be explained on the supposition that species gradually became modified, and the subject haunted me. Although he discussed his work with friends, he shelved his manuscript for years and told his wife to publish it in case he died. In 1958, Darwin received a short essay from Alfred Russell Wallace, a fellow naturalist who had been doing fieldwork in the Malaysian. That essay summarized the thoughts on evolutionary change that Darwin had been mulling over for almost 25 years. Suddenly, Darwin had an incentive to publish his own work. At a scientific meeting later that year, Wallace's essay was presented together with some of Darwin's work. 18 months later, in 1859, Darwin published the result of his work. On the Origin of Species. In his book, he proposed a mechanism of evolution that he called natural selection. He then presented evidence that evolution was been taking place for almost a million years and continued in all living things. Darwin's work caused a sensation. Many people considered his arguments to be brilliant, while others strongly opposed his message. But what did Darwin actually say? Inherited Variation and Artificial Selection One of Darwin's most important insights was that members of each species vary from one another in important ways. Observations during his travels and conversations with plant and animal breathers convinced him that variations existed both in nature and on farms. For example, 
Some plants in a species bear larger fruit than others. Some cows give more milk than others. From breeders, Darwin learned that some of this was heritable variation, differences that are passed from parent to offspring. Darwin had no idea of how heredity worked. Today, we know that heritable variation in organisms is caused by variation in their genes. We also know that genetic variation is found in wild species as well as in domesticated plants and animals. Darwin argued that this variation mattered. This was a revolutionary idea because in Darwin's day, Variation were thought to be unimportant and minor defects. But Darwin noted that plant and animal breathers use heritable variations, what we call genetic variation, to improve crops and livestock. They would select for breeding only the largest hogs, the fastest horses, or the cows that produce the most milk. Darwin termed this process artificial selection. In artificial selection, nature provided the variation and humans selected those variations that they found useful. Artificial selection has produced many diverse domestic animals and crop plants, including the plants shown in figure 15-10 by selectively breeding for different traits. Evolution by Natural Selection Darwin's next insight was to compare processes in nature to artificial selection. By doing so, he developed a scientific hypothesis to explain how evolution occurs. This is where Darwin made his greatest contribution and his strongest break with the past. The struggle for existence. Darwin was convinced that a process like artificial selection worked in nature, but how? He recalled Malthus's work on population growth. Darwin realized that the high birth rates and a shortage of life basic needs would eventually force organisms into a competition for resources. The struggle for existence means that the members of each species compete regularly to obtain food, living space, and other necessities of life. In this struggle, the predators that are fastest or have a particular way of ensnaring other organisms can catch more prey. Those prey that are faster, better camouflaged, or better protected, such as the porcupine shown in figure 15-11 can avoid being caught. This struggle for existence was central to Darwin's theory of evolution. Survival of the fittest. A key factor in the struggle for existence, Darwin observed, was how well suited an organism is to its environment. Darwin called the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its specific environment fitness. Darwin proposed that fitness is the result of adaptations. An adaptation is any inherited characteristic that increases an organism's chance of survival. Successful adaptations, Darwin concluded, enable organisms to become better suited to their environment and thus better able to survive and reproduce. Adaptations can be anatomical or structural characteristics such as a porcupine's sharp quills. Adaptations also include an organism's physiological processes or functions such as the way in which a plant performs photosynthesis. More complex features, such as behavior in which some animals live and hunt in groups, can also be adaptations. The concept of fitness, Darwin argued, was central to the process of evolution by natural selection. 
Generation after generation, individuals compete to survive and produce offspring. The baby birds in figure 15-12, for example, compete for food and space while in the nest. Because each individual differs from other members in its species, each has a unique advantage and disadvantage. Individuals with characteristics that are not well suited to their environment, that is, with low levels of fitness, either die or leave few offspring. Individuals that are better suited to their environment, that is, with adaptations that enable fitness, survive and reproduce most successfully. Darwin called this the process of survival of the fittest. Because of its similarities to artificial selection, Darwin referred to the survival of the fittest as natural selection. In both artificial selection and natural selection, only certain individuals of a population produce new individuals. However, in natural selection, the traits being selected and therefore increasing over time contribute to an organism's fitness in its environment. Natural selection also takes place without human control or direction. Over time, natural selection results in changes in the inherited characteristics of a population. These changes increase a species fitness in its environment. Natural selection cannot be seen directly. It can only be observed as changes in a population over many successive generations. Descent with modification. Darwin proposed that over long periods, natural selection produces organisms that have different structures, establish different niches, or occupy different habitats. As a result, species today look different from their ancestors. Each living species has descended with changes from other species over time. He referred to this principle as descent with modification. Descent with modification also implies that all living organisms are related to one another. To look back in time and you will find common ancestors shared by tigers, panthers, and cheetahs. Look farther back and you will find ancestors that these felines share with horses, dogs, and bats. Further back still are the common ancestors of mammals, birds, alligators, and fishes. If we look far enough back, the logic concludes we could find the common ancestor of all living things. This is the principle known as common descent. According to this principle, all species, living and extinct, were derived from common ancestors. Therefore, a single tree of life links all living things. Evidence of Evolution With this unified, dynamic theory of life, Darwin could finally explain many of the observations he had made during his travels aboard the Beagle. Darwin argued that living things have been evolving on Earth for millions of years. Evidence for this process could be found in the fossil record, the geographical distribution of living species, homologous structures of living organisms, and similarities in early development or embryology. The fossil record. By Darwin's time, scientists knew that fossils were the remains of ancient life and that different layers of rock had been formed at different times during Earth's history. Darwin saw fossils as a record of the history of life on Earth. Darwin, like Lyle, proposed that the Earth was many millions rather than thousands of years old. During this long time, Darwin proposed countless species had come into being, lived for a time, and then vanished.
by comparing fossils from older rock layers with fossils from younger layers, scientists could document the fact that life on Earth has changed over time as shown in figure 15-13. Since Darwin's time, the number of known fossils forms has grown enormously. Researchers have discovered many hundreds of transitional fossils that document various intermediate stages in the evolution of modern species from organisms that are now extinct. Gaps remain, of course, in the fossil record of many species, although a lot of them shrink each year as new fossils are discovered. These gaps do not indicate weaknesses in the theory of evolution itself. Rather, they point out uncertainties in our understanding of exactly how some species evolved. Geographic Distribution of Living Species Remember that many parts of the biological puzzle that Darwin saw on his Beagle voyage involved living organisms. After Darwin discovered that those living brown birds he collected in the Galapagos were all finches, he began to wonder how they came to be similar yet distinctly different from one another. Each species was slightly different from every other species. They were also slightly different from the most similar species on the mainland of South America. Could the island birds have changed over time? as populations in different places adapted to different local environments? Darwin struggled with his question for a long time. He finally decided that all these birds could have descended with modification from a common mainland ancestor. There were other parts to the living puzzle as well. Recall that Darwin found entirely different species of animals on the continents of South America and Australia. Yet, when he looked at the similar environments on these continents, he sometimes saw different animals that had similar anatomies and behaviors. Darwin's theory of descent with modification made scientific sense of this part of the puzzle as well. Species now living on different continents as shown in figure 15-14, had each descended from different ancestors. However, because some animals on each continent were living under similar ecological conditions, they were exposed to similar pressures of natural selection. Because of these similar selection pressures, different animals ended up evolving certain striking features in common. Homologous body structures. Further evidence of evolution can be found in living animals. By Darwin's time, researchers had noticed striking anatomical similarities among the body parts of animals with backbones. For example, the limbs of reptiles, birds, and mammals, arms, wings, legs, and flippers vary greatly in form and function, yet they are all constructed from the same basic bones as shown in figure 15-15. Each of these limbs has adapted in ways that enable organisms to survive in different environments. Despite these different functions, however, these limb bones all develop from the same clumps of cells in embryos. Structures that have different mature forms but develop from the same embryonic tissues are called homologous structures. Homologous structures provide strong evidence that all four limbed vertebrates have descended with modifications from common ancestors. There is still more information to be gathered from homologous structures. If we compare the front limbs, we can see that all bird wings are more similar to one another than any of them are to bats' wings. Other bones in bird skeletons most closely resemble the homologous bones of certain reptiles, including crocodiles and extinct 
reptiles such as dinosaurs. The bones that support the wings of bats, by contrast, are more similar to the front limbs of humans, whales, and other mammals than they are to those of birds. These similarities and differences help biologists group animals according to how recently they last shared a common ancestor. Not all homologous structures serve important functions. The organs of many animals are so reduced in size that they are just vestiges or traces of homologous organs in other species. These vestigial organs may resemble miniature legs, tails, or other structures. The legs of the skinks shown in figure 15-16 are an example of vestigial organs. Why would an organism possess organs with little or no function? One possibility is that the presence of a vestigial organ may not affect an organism's ability to survive and reproduce. In that case, natural selection would not cause the elimination of that organ. Homologies also appear in other aspects of a plant and animal anatomy and physiology. Certain groups of plants and algae for example, share homologous variations in stem, leaf, root, and flower structure, and in the way that carry out photosynthesis. Mammals share many homologies that distinguish them from other vertebrates. Dolphins may look something like fishes, but homologies show that they are mammals. For example, like other mammals, they have lungs rather than gills and obtain oxygen from the air rather than water. Similarities in embryology. The early stages or embryos of many animals with backbones are very similar. This does not mean that a human embryo is ever identical to a fish or a bird embryo. However, as you can see in figure 15-17, many embryos look specifically similar during early stages of development. What do these similarities mean? There have, in the past, been incorrect explanations for these similarities. Also, the biologist Ernst Haeckel fudged some of his drawings to make the earliest stages of some embryos seem more similar than they actually are. Errors aside, however, it is clear that the same groups of embryonic cells develop in the same order and in similar patterns to produce the tissues and organs of all vertebrates. These common cells and tissues growing in similar ways produce the homologous structures discussed earlier.